So welcome everybody to the um, to the second half of the workshop on pricing analytics with um, with R. So the main step for now is that I will try to pick up where we left uh, last week, where we ended last week, and extend our exploratory data analysis with building some GLMs, building some GAMs, getting clusters of postal codes on the map of Belgium. So I'm going to try to explain uh, as much as possible uh, of that part of the workshop, right? So everybody knows you can find the material on GitHub. The RStudio Cloud is, uh, is also ready. It, um, I was also interacting with the people at our studio, so I should be able to have more people registering for the cloud now. So they extended my, um, my capacity. So last week we only had, uh, we could only go up to 10 members using the cloud. So that should be fixed now as well. So if you don't very, feel very comfortable uh, with running these scripts on your own local machine, then first try to do them in the RStudio cloud because they're everything, uh, all the packages are pre-installed for you, right? So I'm going to skip, uh, so this is what we discussed already uh, last week, so this will be a bit fast. Uh, do remember that we uh, launched the data set, it's called the MTPL data set. We have a bunch of covariates in this data set and we want to model frequency and severity as a function of these uh, covariates. Now, so that's what we're going to do today. Um, that's what um, is essential right now. Okay, so we went through the exploratory steps, that's what we did last week. And now I'm going to pick it up again from here, where I start building models with GLMs and GAMs. Huh? So that's the idea. And this is a screen you, you recognize. Huh? So if you think linear regression model, then you think the function ln in R, and what you're going to do is you're going to build a model for your target y, you're going to use a linear predictor x times beta, and you're going to add an epsilon which is a noise term with mean zero and a common variance sigma square. So essentially what you're assuming there is normality huh, uh, of the target variable with a certain mean and with a certain variance. So we already motivated extensively why we want to go to generalized linear modeling. In R, you're going to do that with uh, the function GLM. And you're going to specify a function like this with G, the link function, which is transforming the expected value of your target Y into a so-called linear predictor. And we can allow distributions from the exponential family uh, of distributions. So two examples that make sense as members of this um, exponential family of distributions are on the one hand, if you look at the distribution of n claims, so if you look at the frequency that I sketch over here, then you think Poisson, you think binomial, negative binomial, sorry, so you think a count distribution. If you look at the severity, which is stored in the variable average of AVG in your MTPL data set, then you think about the log normal distribution or a gamma distribution or something like that, okay? So I will um, start with building some simple GLMs before we dive into the GAMs, because also with these GLMs, I want to show you a bit of inst some instructions, huh, which uh, go beyond the instructions that we already discussed about GLMs uh, earlier. So here is my first example. And as you remember from last week, huh, all the code is available in the scripts. You can run these instructions and so on and so forth. So what I'm going to do here is um, I start with making a, a, a brief summary. So I look at the MTPL data set. I group this data set uh, by level of sex, so by gender. So I distinguish between female and male drivers. And I summarize the data set by calculating the empirical claim frequency as the sum of report claims divided by the sum of exposure. So if you run these instructions, you'll get the empirical uh, mean claim frequency for male drivers and female drivers. You see the numbers uh, over here. Yeah. And um, a bit atypical for this data set is that the female drivers are more risky than the male drivers huh, with an average of 0 0.14 versus an average of 0 0.13. We can also directly plot these empirical um, uh, mean claim frequencies by adding a ggplot statement. So to do this ggplot, I'm going to use the data set that I just created. So that's this freq by gender data set. 
I'm going to use this data set to put up my canvas. I specify as the aesthetics that you want to have gender on the x-axis and you want to visualize the empirical uh, frequency on the y-axis. So this mp frec, that's the variable that I calculated over here, which is stored in my data set frec by gender, right? And then I, uh, I'm doing a bar plot. I'm using the cool um, blue and green. I'm putting the transparency at a, a level of 0 0.5. So go ahead, play with these values, see what the effect is. Now you can say, Katrien, why are you doing all this? Because you're not building any model yet. Right? You're back to the exploratory data analysis. Well, I want you to keep in mind the values that we just created, calculated. And we're going to see now how that relates to um, our GLMs. Right. So here is the first GLM that I wish to consider. So I'm going to build a GLM for number of claims, so n claims, as a function of the covariate gender, so tilde and then the name of this covariate. And I'm going to include as an offset the log of exposure. Yeah? So this is something we already explained earlier on in the tutorial, which comes back here uh, again. And in the next instructions, uh, I'm going to specify uh, which uh, member of the family of distributions do I want to use. I want to use a Poisson, which has the link function, uh, the logarithmic function, and I want to use as my data set the MTPL data set. Yeah? So you see here at the right hand side some side notes about what I'm doing. This is a Poisson GLM. It uses a logarithmic link, and this implies the following specification. So the log of the expected value of y is x transpose times beta. So at the, uh, at the scale of the response, the expected value of y is the exponential of x times beta. That's what we do, right? Now to think about this offset once again, because it's very important, so, so keep an eye on, 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 on that, we include the logarithm of the exposure as an offset term in the linear predictor. So this is a slight typo. I changed the name x to expo. So here in gray, of course, it should be it should be the log of expo, the exposure variable. So if you include the uh, log of exposure in your, um, in your linear predictor as an offset, that means you do not estimate a regression coefficient or a regression parameter for, for, for that variable, right? So the corresponding beta is equal to one. And the reason why we do that is because as such, the expected value of our, of our response y is then the exposure multiplied with the exponential function evaluated in the intercepts, beta zero plus beta one times, and what you see here is a so-called indicator function. So this is on if I have a male driver, so this takes the value one if I have a male driver, and it is zero if I do not have a, if I have a female driver, right? So that's the model that I'm, that I'm capturing. Now let's look at the results, because I want you to draw some conclusions here. So we calibrate this model and we store the results in the object frec underscore glm underscore one, right? And now, of course, what you can do to, to get insights into what this model is, is giving me is you could type a summary of frec glm one. That's what we earlier uh, did earlier on. But at this point, I also kindly introduce you to the package uh, Broom in R. And Broom is part of the tidyverse and allows me to get the results of the fitted model in a very tidy way, so in a very clean way, right? So if I do frec glm1 pipe operator and then I use the tidy function from the broom package, then I'll get my um, terms, my estimates, my standard errors in a very clean way, in a very nice way, yeah? So what you'll see here is that this is my fitted value for the intercept. This is my fitted value for the beta one that comes with the indicator variable that says, are you a male driver or not? Uh, so what I'm doing here is I'm going to construct um, a display with the fitted, with the fitted values of my, um, of my data set. Um, and to construct these fitted values, I'm going to use the function augment, augment, from the Broom package. And with GLMs, it's important that you specify at which level you want to include your, um, you want to fit your predicted values. So I'm specifying here, give me the predicted values at the level of the response. Yeah. So that means that I'm really going to calculate what the, what the y hats um, uh, 
what the y hats uh, will, will be. And maybe it's a good idea to take a moment um, to explain that quite carefully because it's, uh, it's going to be crucial in the next uh, modeling steps uh, that we want to that we want to do. So allow me to, um, if I can, to change my screen for a moment. Um, sorry, this is a bit unanticipated, but maybe it works. Um, what the um, Differences are between if you if you do predictions at the level of the response at the level of the uh, turns and at the level of the uh, linear predictor because these are the options that you have in your um, in your predict function that comes with a uh, GMA. So I hope you can you can see my screen. So these are the three options that I have, and I want to know what is the the difference between these between these three. And that's it's important to keep that in mind because I'm going to use that quite extensively um, throughout uh, the next steps in, in the course. So if we think about a GLM, then we think about um, a link function applied to an expected value of y being something like a beta one times a beta, sorry, a beta zero times, a beta zero plus a beta one times uh, an x1 and so on, okay? So if we look at the predictions at the level of the response, yeah, what we're then going to construct is the fitted value, of the expected value of y. So what we're then going to do is we're going to do g inverse, and we're going to do beta 0 hat plus beta 1 hat times x1. That's what you're going to calculate. Now, so you really want to know, given the covariates that I observed for my um, observation i, what is the fitted value for the expected outcome. If you, on the other hand, say I want to have my prediction at the link level, yeah, what you're then going to calculate is just the beta 0 hat, plus the beta 1 hat times the x1. So you're not going to do the inverse of the link function. You're not going to make the transition to the scale of the response. And if you say, I want to have the turns, that allows you to isolate one specific, um, one specific covariate and its associate effect. So in this case, I would be able to get that for the, uh, for the x1 uh, covariate. Huh? And with the gamma, if you would work with these with these terms, then you would get like the fitted f hat evaluated in x1. So that would be the equivalent if you would do this um, for a gamma, right? Uh, um, so these are the three different uh, transformations or the three different options that you have uh, when you are using the predict function uh, when you are constructing fitted values or predicted values in in R. Okay, so I'm gonna, is that clear for everybody? Any questions here? If not, then we're gonna go back to the slides where we, where we are. So this is crucial in this uh, type predict because this tells me, okay, I want to have the prediction at the level of the response. So this is one of the three options that I explained uh, earlier on, right? So if you see here, um, the fitted values that I construct here with this uh, augment and then type predict this response, those will be constructed for the whole data set. Huh? So I only show the first two records over here to give you an idea. I have a male driver, I have a female driver. Yeah? If I want to do this a little bit more manually. That's what you see here at the right hand side. So here I'm going to do the manual work and I'm really going to say, yeah, how does this work? I need to extract the fitted coefficients from the fitted GLM object 
I need to take the first coefficient that gives me the intercept. I need to take the exponential of the intercept. And that's the predicted outcome for a female driver. That is the 0 0.1484. Uh, on the other hand, if I take the beta 0, the first coefficient, plus the beta 1, the slope that comes with our, are you a male driver or not, then I can manually construct a prediction for this um, male driver, and that will be the 0 0.136 and so on. This is also the reason why I started with this uh, exploratory data analysis example earlier on, because now, of course, these two numbers that we recognize over here and over here, these are exactly the same as what we calculated earlier on, hmm, on sheet uh, 53 over here. And that's because I'm constructing a GLM where there is only one covariate um, used, and that's the gender covariate. So then you see, as we already uh, showed in one of the classes earlier on, that the prediction that you get over here hmm, is just the empirical mean claim frequency per uh, level of the factor variable that you include in, in your genome. Okay, so this was a warm-up uh, exercise. Um, you'll see here um, some, some ideas huh, to, to play a little bit with this code. And this essentially centers on the distinction that I explained on the iPad, huh, the distinction between getting a fitted value or getting a predicted value at the level of the link, at the level of the response, and at the level of the terms. Yeah? So if you look at the exercise and if you try to um, work with that, with that yourself, here you see if I put, if I'm using the predict function in R, and if I specify type is response, versus type is link, and so on. And then you'll see the differences and the connections between these um, predicted values uh, being constructed. For those who are slightly new to R, it is important to be aware that every, or almost every model that you fit in R comes with a so-called predict function. Yeah. So this predict function allows you to apply the fitted model, in this case, the fitted GLM, to a new data frame, right? This could also be that the data frame that contains the, the observations that, 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 that you observed, right? But you could also use it on the new data frame. So what I'm doing here is I create as the data, as a data frame male driver, I create a specification for a male driver, right? And now my model is using two inputs. It's using the exposure, and it is using the gender of my, um, uh, of my driver, right? So I should specify this exposure being, or, or I specify the exposure being equal to one here, and I specify uh, gender equal to male for the male driver, and for the female driver profile, I put that equal to, to female. Yeah? Uh, once again, I notice that I have a slight typo here because it should be expo. Huh? Uh, it will be correct in the code, uh, but it's not correct on the, on the the sheet because I changed the variable of this uh, exposure variable to, to expo. So these are two data frames that I create and I can now apply the predict function to them. So I do frac GLM1. Um, that's the, the model object that stores the results uh, of, my, of my GLM. I apply that to male driver and I ask to get the fitted values at the level of the response and then I recognize this 0 0.136 and so on again, which I, already, um, which I already encountered before. Yeah, so have a look at those uh, instructions to get fitted values at different levels out of your um, GLM object. And to conclude this uh, short discussion of, of GLMs, let's do one more, and this is a gamma regression model, where I put as the target variable the um, severity stored in the variable average, I use as the covariate the, the gender. And now I'm going to specify, let's do a gamma regression with a logarithmic link function. And let's uh, fit this um, gamma regression model. And here you see then the resulting uh, coefficients. Good. So let's now jump from the GLMs to the GAMs. Uh, so this is what we spent the first hour on, uh, explaining you this type of, of, of structure for the predictor. Uh, you see here again, you, you have an additive predictor, uh, you can put smooth functions in there, you can put smooth functions of one covariate, of uh, multiple covariates, that's what you want to do now, right? 
And important to keep in mind is that the preferred R package to, to work with that is um, called MGCV um, by Professor Simon Wood. Uh, so also the, the textbook that you see on the, on the left is covering this package um, extensively. Yeah. So let's go through the basics huh, of um, fitting these, these, these GAMs in R. So if you look at slide number 61, that's something that I can skip now because this is what I already uh, covered in the, in the theory in the first hour. So here you see again the use of basis functions, the wiggliness penalty, and then the lambda that is driving the trade-off between goodness of fit and, and wiggliness, right? And so here is a, a bit of an, an experiment on, on doing these, uh, on using these different uh, or, or on using different values for lambda and different number of, of, of uh, basis functions. Yeah? So you'll see that in R, in the MGCV package, and, and we'll come to the syntax um, right away, but what you can see here is that you can play with the smoothing parameter. Uh, it's called SP in, in this MGCV package. And you can play with the number and also with the type of the basis functions. So the number says, yeah, how many of these basis functions do I want? The smoothing parameter says, yeah, how strongly should the effect be of, of the penalty that I include? And then the type of basis functions, if, if, we, if you remind Ahmed's question um, earlier on. So there you see that you can also play with different um, basis functions. Now in the six fits that I show you over here, I'm using a built-in data set from R. It's called the mCycle data set. And it puts, oh, to be honest, I forgot what it has on the, on the y-axis. That's a particular outcome we're interested in. And we have one covariate, which is called times. And you see here the observed value. So you see that there is clearly a nonlinear relation between your outcome and your covariate, right? So this, by no means, huh, uh, will be captured easily with a, with a, with a linear regression model, huh, unless you're going to go for um, piecewise constant, uh, sorry, piecewise polynomials or, or, or putting some, some non-linear non function manually together, okay? Now, if we look at the first uh, row of plots here, then you'll see that in these three plots, I put the smoothing parameter to zero, right? So just to explain or to motivate you a little bit how that goes, so if I go back to the previous slide, if my smoothing parameter is equal to zero, then the penalty that you have over here is not included, right? So I'm just going to minimize my uh, negative log likelihood or maximize my uh, log likelihood. And you will see here if I only define two basis functions, so k is very slow, only two basis functions, then I get a very uh, unsatisfying fit here huh? because the function has not enough flexibility, has not enough basis functions, to pick up this linear, non-linear trend. If I increase the number of basis functions, things get a little bit better. And if I increase the number of basis functions up to 15, sorry, the number of knots up to uh, 15, hmm, then you'll see that I get a very wiggly fit here. And the reason why I get a very wiggly fit here is because I don't do any, uh, I don't have my penalty, huh, so I don't enforce my, uh, the smoothness of my uh, constructed um, uh, of, my, of my fitted model here, right? So this is the effect of playing with the number of uh, knots in case you do not include any smoothing. Yeah? So in case you put the penalty uh, or you leave out the penalty from the likelihood that you're optimizing. If you then look at the bottom um, of, these, uh, of the plot over here, I'm going to use the default number of um, uh, knots. Uh, so R has, or the MGCV package has some built-in routines to pick this uh, number of knots. And now we're going to play with the smoothing uh, parameter. So we see that if we put the smoothing parameter to a very large value, uh, for instance, smoothing parameter equal to 10 here, that we're essentially getting a linear, uh, a linear effect. Yeah? So even though we have a lot of uh, flexibility because we have quite some uh, basis functions included. Um, this, the, the, the fitted function that we create here huh, will be pushed to a, um, to a regression line because 
we give a lot of weight to our penalty. And we give a lot of weight to our penalty. We essentially force this penalty to become zero. And that will become zero if we get uh, a linear behavior here between our response and the variable times. On the other hand, if we pick both the optimal value for the smoothing parameter and the default number of basis functions, then you see that I get a very nice, flexible uh, curve fitted here, which is not too wiggly. It's not ex as exotic as the one that I have over here. Huh? So it's doing just the appropriate level of smoothness. Yeah? So that's the whole um, idea. So to continue a little bit and then taking time for questions, how would you do that with, um, with so what would be the syntax? Hmm? So here I have my MG, I got a question, but I'm gonna answer it um, right away. So let me first, um, unless it's a technical, yeah. So it's a question from Jonathan. So how is the optimal smoothing parameter here determined? That's a very good question. So I'm gonna use here this REML uh, method that I mentioned um, in the first hour. So essentially you will see that the GUM function allows you to define by which method do you want to pick this uh, smoothing parameter? And you've got a couple of options there, a cross-validation approach, or this REML strategy, or this AIC kind of thinking. Uh, I'm going to say a few words about that on the, on the next uh, sheet. Yeah. So here is my syntax. Yeah. So this is important. This is a really basic syntax to do a GAM. Um, it's a GAM with MGCV because there are other packages in R to do GAM modeling, but MGCV is really state-of-the-art. Uh, it's also being copied to Python, etc. So people have been building uh, Python libraries that essentially uh, do the same as what this uh, R library is, uh, is doing. There is also a version of MGCV that allows you to do GAN modeling with really big data sets. And it's called BAM, where the B is for big. Yeah. In case you wonder, MGCV is standing for Mixed GAM Computation Vehicle. It has automatic smoothness of estimation. So that comes also back to Jonathan's question. So when you define uh, the methods that you want to use, this uh, procedure will automatically tune your uh, smoothness parameter and estimate the smoothness parameter for you. Yeah? And here is the uh, essential modeling instruction. So we built a GAM model. So the function is called GAM. Uh, we specify here the target. It's called acceleration, this simple example, and we do that as a function of times. And we say here, I want to have a smoother, so S is for smoother, I want to have a smoother of times. And then I can specify which smoothing parameter, which number of K I want to do, do, and which uh, basis functions I want to use. Uh, so here, for instance, I could explicitly say I want to use the cubic spline, um, uh, cubic spline basis functions and build a cubic spline a cubic regression uh, spline. I have to specify which family do I want to use. So here I just do Gaussian because my uh, response variable acceleration, um, I don't have any uh, specific distribution for that in mind, just a normal distribution. And here I specify what my data set is, that's the M cycle uh, data set. Now, so these are three arguments that you can play around with. But uh, as became clear from the previous slides, uh, typically you would not put values for this SP and this K yourself, but you let those being uh, optimized by the internal uh, functionalities of, of, of the routine, right? And to come back to Jonathan's question, so here I demonstrate how I can, um, which kind of methods that I would like to use to estimate my smoothing parameter. Uh, and if you want to read more technical details, but that's definitely beyond uh, the purpose of this course. But if you want to have more technical details about that, you can look, um, you can look uh, over here. Okay, so I hope that uh, satisfies the question. I have another question from Said. So the lambda captures the flexibility and the complexity at the same time. Yes, indeed, because if you're uh, having a less flexible function, then you also have a less complex function, right? And then you reduce uh, to a linear regression line or, or, or something, yeah. Okay, just a few extra words. Um, how to get insights into the results of this GAM. You can do print of the results stored in the model object. 
you can get access to the fitted smoothing parameter by doing model and then dollar sign sp. And so remember model, that's where, I, that's where I saved my instructions in. That's the object that stores my results. And you can use built-in uh, visualizations of the fitted smoothers using the plot instructions. And you've got a couple of options there you can play around with. That. So that's the first um, instruction uh, for, my, um, for my guns. Yeah. Um, so now we're going to continue with our, with our Poisson stuff. Huh? And the way how I built that up was, um, let's start with looking into the age of the policyholder. So we're doing the MTPL data set. We're going to focus on the age of the policyholder. And we're going to wonder, yeah, how would I, how would I really include this age of the policyholder in my, in my model? Okay. So what you see over here is a graph that we did last week uh, in, um, in times where we will still, when we would still be meeting in, um, in real life in the computer room, uh, we constructed uh, this graph where you see the different ages on the x-axis and the empirical mean claim frequency per age observed on the y-axis. So this gives me a bit of a first insight on what the relation is between claim frequency and, and age of the policy. But now I want to capture this relation uh, with a model. Yeah? And what I will do in the code is I'm going to explore four different ways to do this. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a feeling on uh, what are the pros and cons of different um, techniques. So first thing I will do is I will include age as a linear effect in a GLM. Second thing, I will include age as a factor in the GLM. Then I'm going to split my ages manually into bits and put those as factor variables in the GLM instruction. And finally, I will go to my, let's say, my golden standard. I will do a smooth effect of age of the policy holder with this um, GAM instruction. Okay. So um, here we go. Hmm? Uh, I need one helper function to nicely visualize the fitted effects, and that's the uh, object A here. So this object A stores all the ages observed in my data set from minimum to maximum. Yeah? So if you run this instruction and you let, uh, you, you show the, the object A then, then you will see that I go there from 18 till I don't know which age, uh, but you've got there all the ages observed in, in the data set. Okay. So here are the, um, here are the essentials. So in my first model, I say, let's do a linear effect of age of the policyholder. Yeah. So that's just a GLM as I know it. Yeah. I model as my target the end claims, and I use as my covariate this age of the policyholder. I do an offset term, I specify my data set, and I specify um, the distribution that I want to use and the link function that I want to use. Yeah. So all of that is quite familiar. What I now want to do and what I show on the, on the right hand side here is I'm going to extract the predicted values from this object, uh, this GLM model stored in the object frec GLM age. And I'm going to use this GLM to create fitted values, predicted values, for a data frame uh, that I put together like this. So I create a data frame where I use the ages stored in the object A, where I give everybody exposure equal to one. And I ask the routine to give me the predicted values at the level of the term. So I really isolate on the beta, uh, beta times h uh, covariate. That's what I explained on the iPad um, earlier on. Uh, and I also ask the procedure to calculate the corresponding uh, standard errors. And the next steps then are purely visualization steps. So here I extract the fitted values, I extract a lower bound for the point-wise confidence interval and an upper bound for these uh, confidence intervals and I put that all together. So this is the, the term huh, from my linear predictor that captures this, this, this H effect. If I use H as a linear, if I include a linear effect of H in my uh, Poisson regression. Okay. Does that make sense? So this is a very naive first model doing uh, age linearly. Yeah. Let's move on. What if happens if I include age 
as a factor variable. Yeah? So now I'm, I'm going to use uh, the observed ages and I'm going to say, well, treat them as factor variables. So I'm going to do as dot factor evaluated in each of the policy folder. So now my routine, my GLM routine knows, okay, I need to fit a um, separate beta parameter for all of the ages which are observed in, in my data set. And that's what this as dot factor um, would do. All the other instructions remain the same. So I again extract the fitted values by using typist terms. I put them together for visualization problems, uh, visualization purposes, and I got the calibrated age effect like this. So this is of course super wiggly huh? because I treat each individual age separately and I include a beta parameter for each age in my data set. Okay, so that's the second approach um, that I want to that I want to mention here. Yeah. Last or oh no, a third option. What if we do some manual splitting of this age of the policy holder into five year bins and use them now in this um, in this GLM um, in this GLM routine and um, I'm going to load my data set. Voila. I'm going to prepare for my data set to be available. So this is something we covered last week. Um, I'm going to load the shape file, even though I don't need it right away, but then that's been done. And now I'm here at the basics of uh, model building. Yeah. So if I go to my procedure, and I was just documenting. So that's around line 157. Uh, so do allow me to show it uh, with some live demo. So I create the object A. So for those who didn't understand what this A was doing, if you just type A, you'll see from the minimum age to the maximum age observed, you've got one value. So it's a nice vector or a grid of values that you can use. If we do the GLM, with the age of the policy holder as a linear effect, yeah, then you can see that I can estimate this, um, this GLM and that if I ask for the summary of FREC GLM age, that I get something like this. So I see that the only thing I do is I fit an intercept and I fit a beta, a slow parameter that comes with the age effect, right? The next lines introduce me or, or show me how to do the visual. So that should appear over here. So that's the visual that you saw on my sheets. The next uh, bunch of code is going to do this um, GLM using H as a factor effect. Voilà. So it's a little bit slower already because it has to calibrate all these betas. Let's wait for it. Voila. And if I then do the summary of FREC GLM HF, then now you should see that you've got a beta for every age observed in your data set, except the first one, because of course, if we have K levels in our factor variable, we're going to calibrate, uh, we're going to include K minus one dummies. Mm -hmm. Uh, when we're doing an intercept uh, as well. And if I visualize this effect, then I'll get something like this. I got a question, so I'm going to look at the question. Matthias, is it possible to briefly recap from slide 64 onwards? Um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm going to continue here, uh, Matthias. It's recorded anyway, so you will be able to review it afterwards. And now I'm essentially um, doing what I just explained on the sheet. So I'm doing that here um, live in, in our studio, right? So we arrived now at a point where we want to do the, the binning of H manually. Huh? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use this sequencing function. And I'm going to go from minimum to maximum in steps of five. So let's see what the effect of that is. So I started in the variable level, 
if I let the levels run, so I see that I now get the endpoints of the bins that I wish to consider. So my first manual bin is going to go from 18 to 23, then from 23 to 28, and so on and so forth. Right? And what I'm now going to use is this cut function in, um, in R. So this allows me to cut or to bin the continuous variable h using the breakpoints that I stored in the level variable. Yeah. So if we see how that works, um, so we're going to fit this model, frec glm h c, if we ask a summary, so frec glm h c, and if we now inspect the output, then you see that I got a beta for the intercept, of course, then I've got a beta for the interval that goes from 23 to 28, a beta that goes from 28 to, 20, to 33, and so on. So here I'm doing this uh, piecewise constant approach quite manually, right? Um, and if I visualize this effect, or the fitted model, the fitted H effect, I'll get something like this. Yeah. So here you see, you've got your beta for H, um, what was it again, 23, so the first, uh, so the first beta is going from 23 to 28 and so on and so forth. Yeah. So that's what we got over here. Now our final strategy is that we say, okay, let's avoid all these ad hoc choices and let's tell the procedure right away. I want to have a smooth effect of H of the policy folder. So I'm going to use the function yeah, from the MGCV package. Yeah. And I'm going to specify this particular model for my uh, number of plates. So the use of exposure is the same, the data set is the same, the distribution is the same, the link function is the same. The only thing that changes is that I want to have this smoother of each of the policy. So what can we do? We can inspect, I think, the summary right away. So frec gam h. So we've got some information here about the intercept, because the GAM is also going to do an intercept. And we get some information about the smooth terms. We get, for instance, the effective degrees of freedom. So the higher this number over here is, the more parameters were needed to capture the um, flexible effect. And so typically, you will see there if the number is very small, effective degrees of freedom, then your smoother is probably not going to be significant, and you've got um, uh, maybe I shouldn't say it like that, then, then you don't have a very flexible function, and huh? then maybe you'll reduce to a linear uh, relationship or something. But here, okay, we see um, our smoother. We can evaluate the fitted terms, and we can plot the, the effect as well. So here, this is now what my smoother of H is uh, going to tell me. Yeah. So to come back to Emmanuel's question um, earlier on, so what you'll see here now is the idea is this is the value of zero. Huh? So for these middle-aged drivers, uh, I sort of have a, um, a sort of um, yeah, baseline uh, effect if you want, and then the younger drivers take a value of the smoother which is uh, positive, huh? significantly positive. And then the risk, so that means there are higher risks, right? they have a higher expected number of claims. Then this um, smooth effect becomes negative and it starts to increase again for more senior drivers, although with a lot of uh, uncertainty. Yeah? So this is the effect that I'm capturing with my, with my gap. So let us see, uh, okay what uh, we want to do here. So if I go back to my sheets, this is what we learned then. Huh? This is model four with the smoother of, uh, of H. And you can also visualize this smoother of H directly with the built-in plotting instructions coming with the MGV, MGCV package. So that's what you get over here. Uh, and that's what you can um, play around with. Yeah. So maybe, um, because it's becoming um, already quite close to noon. Let's take some questions related to these, um, to what we showed at this point. So any feedback on that? <laughs> 